It was great while it lasted. So many of us bought the dream, sold to us by bankers. You could get rich quick, just buying a house. You could borrow what you wanted. Money was cheap, and as soon as you bought, you'd made a profit, since prices were rising. That is, until our banks went into a crisis late last year, bringing us all to our senses. It put the spotlight on the bankers that landed everyone in a mess. We believed we were doing something that actually was, was good for Ireland and good for Irish business. We're all paying off the price of that recklessness. It was never a comfortable feeling, but it was his word, it was his sign-off. Tonight, Primetime investigates how our banks were brought to the verge of collapse, so that here at Government Buildings, in the small hours of October 30th last year, a deal was done between the government and bankers to guarantee all of what the banks owed, roughly 440 billion euro, or twice our GDP at the time. Tonight we ask the bankers what they did to bring us to the brink, and we ask why the financial regulator, knowing the risks, did so little to prevent it. The new governor of the central bank said last week that we may over time get closer to what caused the banking crisis. I expect that the Eurofthus will in time decide to authorise some form of inquiry to try to understand the deeper underlying causes of this crisis so that wider lessons can be learned from the future. But most of us want answers urgently. Answers from the bankers, answers from the regulator and answers from the politicians about how they got it so wrong. In every single examination that's been done on this, people are not overborrowed. We can see a situation in the credit unions where they have vast amounts of, of, of money, which they'd be glad to borrow. Uh, it's, it's equally so in the banks. We are living in the midst of the longest and strongest era of sustained prosperity in our history. That didn't happen by chance. Boomtime banking started in 2003. From that time on, it wasn't economic success or demand, but banking itself that created the property bubble. The indications are that bank lending was not the driver before 2003, but afterwards it was, and the banks started to import funds that they could readily borrow from abroad and, if you like, shovel them into the Irish property market. Without a doubt, uh, the, without the bank lending, there wouldn't have been this boom. Loan managers went on a bender, lending increasingly large sums to developers. This is where the behaviour of the banks changed from reckless to suicidal. By 2007, they were lending over 100 billion. That's more than they'd been lending to everybody in Ireland five or six years before. The best way to find out what happened in Irish banking is to look more closely at the bank that stood out in the game of massive lending, Anglo. It put huge competitive pressure on all the other banks. Analysts with stockbrokers were saying, look at the profits that Anglo is making. These guys are eating your lunch. Soon, Anglo's aggressive lending model caught on. If you couldn't beat them, you joined them. The Anglo-Irish Bank's expansion was a destabilizing factor in the market, and I've referred to the bank as our rogue bank. Anglo grew continuously until the crisis. For Anglo's chief executive, it was as much about taking on AIB and Bank of Ireland, the establishment banks, as anything else. It's not about making money, it's a game. Money is just evidence. All the time it's about winning and losing. Anglo-Irish Bank reported profits for the year to September 1987 of 1.6 million euros. Last year we reported profits of 1.2 billion. That's an increase of 60,000%. The government has announced that Anglo-Irish Bank is to be nationalised. The Garda fraud squad search Anglo-Irish Bank's head office. The unacceptable behaviour of the former chairman has done immense damage to this institution. It wasn't meant to be like this for Sean Fitzpatrick, a man who to this day people heap praise on. Great personality, um, everyone would know him in the room. People wanted to be in his company. John Rowan was a senior executive at Anglo for many years until he resigned as head of UK operations in 2005. I worked with Sean for 20 years. He was a super chief executive and a fine chairman. 
I was um, happy to have worked with Sean and proud to have worked with him. We believed we were doing something that actually was, was good for Ireland and good for Irish business. Anglo's business approach was simple. It was property all the way. Anglo had a very lucrative uh, lending model, which was driven by property ultimately. It seemed to be the, the, the goose that was laying the, gold, the golden egg. While most people who get a mortgage must make regular repayments on the loan plus interest, developers paid interest only. In addition, Anglo allowed them to put off repaying the loan indefinitely, rolling it up as a bigger and bigger loan as they kept borrowing. Michael Dowling, a broker for many medium-sized developers throughout the boom, had intimate knowledge of the way banks worked. The deals he saw given to developers gave a whole new meaning to the term bank rolling. The ability to roll on the facility from one site to a next and all the builder was doing was essentially servicing the interest, uh, you know, propelled the problem. When developments were sold, instead of repaying the loan, the builder put the profits into a new site with finance where decisions were made very quickly so that people could buy land and, 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 and buy it at expensive prices. As developers borrowed ever greater amounts, the bank's balance sheets grew rapidly. In 2005, Sean Fitzpatrick's successor as chief executive, David Drum, pledged to double profits in five years. By driving lending growth, he did it in two. We've just reported uh, the biggest profits in the history of the bank, 46% uh, increase, one and a quarter billion. There was a belief that, that, that these were, these were uh, like a new paradigm, that these were, these were changed times. Peter, not his real name, was a senior loan manager for Anglo in the UK until recently. At the height of the boom, he saw firsthand what went on when Anglo backed Ireland's top developers as they poured money into the UK market. At risk to his career, he spoke to us. There was a huge focus on breaking the billion euros profit and everything seemed to be geared towards that. If you're starting off looking after 40 or 50 million pounds of loans and you end up looking after six or 700 million pounds of the loans, you are in heavily incentivized to continue that growth. You start cutting corners. Did you? I can probably think of three or four loans that in hindsight I would not have done. And yeah, that does make me feel uncomfortable. As the boom went on, Anglo's strategy was to concentrate on a small group of top clients. Peter gives examples of those who could borrow into the billions. Ballymore had total group limits of over two billion euros. Jerry Gannon, north of one billion. These sums were vast. Anglo let the developers call the shots. There were 10 or 20 clients of the bank that could ring up and virtually get a full approval over the phone because they were known to the very senior executives in the bank. This meant that in chasing the big money of the top developers, Anglo was prepared to abandon its own vital risk assessment procedures, bypassing the bank's credit committee and board. Banks have credit committees for a very good reason. All of them have it. And they're simply to ensure that the borrower is, has got the wherewithal to pay it back. It's vital. It's, it's, the, it's the bread and butter um, appraisal of l lending. And the board usually is a step up from the credit committee. It tells us that, uh, you know, there's no respect whatsoever to the safety of the institution. You're undermining it. In banking parlance, Anglo moved up the risk curve dramatically at the height of the boom. For the top Irish developers investing in the UK, phone calls from Dublin reversed important London decisions. There were situations where a deal was declined by London Credit Committee. And then two hours later, you hear that it's been approved. What was a healthy, competitive and aggressive business culture at some point, um, perhaps that you know, um, changed into being um, into pr into some pride, and pride perhaps became arrogance and a sense of being, of being bulletproofed from, from any possible failure. I promise you, we didn't take bigger risks. I think we actually took less risk. So blind were they to risk, Anglo also lent money to both the investors and the developers in the same deal. If it went wrong, they could lose on the double. The bank seemed to be pushing deals that it had sourced. It would provide lending to enable borrowers to buy into that deal. It seemed very, well, far too close to comfort. Personally, I would not have been a fan because I think it does bring, it, it does multi-tier your risk in a way that's, that becomes difficult to, 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 to accept. It happened in Anglo, yes. It happened in lots of other banks as well. The relationship between the bankers and top developers became increasingly tight. You had senior guys in the bank spending a lot of time with the Golden Circle or very successful developers 
you know, if you mix with developers that are taking you around to sites in private jets and helicopters, you, know, you start getting used to it. The hospitality flowed freely in both directions. Jerry Gannon had been uh, entertained twice by the team in London and each meal had come to more than £16,000 for uh, approximately eight to ten people. Jerry Gunn was just one of many developers to get treated well. I believe there was another occasion. It was mentioned that this particular client had built the house of one of the senior executives in the bank and if he wanted X million pounds that day, he would get it. That wasn't credit approval as far as I was concerned. We passed through the, the magic mark of a billion uh, in profits that we expect to make even more profits in 2008. As lending and profits grew, so did their big bonuses. By 2007, David Drum's annual salary was 3.2 million, Willie McIntyre's 1.4, and other senior executives made over a million. I don't believe that, um, that greed, which is probably how people would see all this, I don't think greed was, was, was a driving force. I think there was a pride in, in the success of what was going on. Um, but we have arrived. Uh, and we ain't going anywhere. Sean Fitzpatrick wasn't the only one in denial. The central bank and regulator appeared oblivious as alarm bells rang loudly. Anglo-Irish Bank grew from 3% of the market to 18% in a decade. That's a growth rate of 36% per annum real. Uh, just ridiculously rapid and I would have thought grounds for saying, no, this, this bank must be stopped. Even if we don't have detailed information, the probability is that they cannot safely grow at that rate. The regulator's failure to stop Anglo was a disaster for the whole banking system. Anglo's aggressive lending became standard. They took the market share from other banks. And the other banks uh, had to decide whether they were going to respond or, or sit back and allow their market share to shrink. Certainly Anglo was seen very much as being the model to emulate. And the mortgage books had doubled, uh, consumer lending had doubled, and lending into the construction or, if you like, the, the property development sector had also doubled. Bill Hobbs was head of business strategy at ACC Bank until 2005. He saw a new breed of loan managers emerge who wanted to go places fast. At one time the car park was full of company cars. There were Passats, Mondeos. I'd say less than a year, uh, the car park was full of BMW 3 Series, 5 Series, Marquee Series, soft tops, 4x4s. You knew something had happened. They were very inexperienced in lending, um, very good at going out and, and selling. All banks went the same way, including the two establishment banks. AIB even admitted setting up an Anglo win-back team to steal their customers. Our loan book is up 30% in the Republic of Ireland. They want to do more business with us. We must be doing something right. The profits are high, but it's a big business. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge business. And maybe we all got carried away in the euphoria. Well, hindsight, of course, is, um, is, is wonderful. Uh, we have made mistakes. Well, it's actually for the dentist. Train tracks are changing, bit of cash, you know what I mean? No problem. We it very people. much became a sales culture. Yeah, a lot of people enjoyed it. There was no tomorrow. John Barrett was a commercial lending manager in permanent TSB until 2007. He saw how competitive pressure loosened lending criteria. Almost each passing month, a bank would bring in a new policy saying, look, we lend to a higher loan to value. It'll be easier to get it. It'll be at a lower rate. So you, you had banks almost cannibalizing each other's loan books. It was almost a vicious circle of almost outdoing each other. As the boom went on, the banks fed people's increasing appetite for property investment. You could release equity from the family home and buy abroad, self-certify your income and get interest-only mortgages. Permanent TSB also brought out the professional investor product. I suppose the only area that would have been of concern to me was the experienced investor or professional investor product if you already owned two properties, you could borrow to buy more, as loan repayments were solely based on rental income. If you're lending purely on the rent and ignoring the applicant's other borrowings, um, the difficulty that arises is that if the rent wasn't paid or if the applicant had significant other borrowings, you, you weren't taking those into the calculation. Foreign banks hugely increased competition too. When Royal Bank of Scotland took over Ulster Bank, they increased targets for sales and lending. 
Kieran Finan was a senior manager who felt the pressure. Well, particularly in the lending area, they felt that trying to grow uh, a lending book by t between 20 and 30 percent would be uh, unachievable. Yet at the same time, it was achieved. The pressures being applied were um, constructed from the top in that top management were set a particular remuneration package which if delivered would enhance their personal wealth very substantially. Did you yourself feel it? I felt pressure of course, everyone felt pressure um, and uh, some people could deal with it and some people couldn't. Bankers say it was impossible to shout stop amid the noise of fast selling and lending. You're coming up against a team that has a very short term view who are bonus to achieve uh, certain results within a year. You can quite easily be sidelined or silenced um, through sheer pressure uh, and, and that regularly happens. That comes as part of the territory when you're, when, when, when you're a strategy manager as I was. Uh, but I was also seeing this happening to risk managers and compliance people who are, who are trying to raise issues individuals who, are, who would, would have had views um, would have been largely intimidated into, into silence. ACC denies such a culture existed at the bank. At the height of the boom, lenders and brokers were entitled to offer loans at staggering levels. It brought situations where you had eight, nine times salary being made available to individuals. You know, human nature would be, well, I'll go for that amount, rather than sitting back and maybe being a bit prudent. Please don't let them be up. On top of this, in the summer of 2005, banks started lending 100% of the property value. At the end of the day, we have to compete, and you compete across a range of dimensions. The fact that 100% loans are, are available is, is pumping up the demand for houses, it's keeping prices up. It's part of the expansion of credit helping the boom along. In reality, you might have been borrowed 110, 115% because you were borrowing to, to cover the, the other uh, items involved in buying a new property. Equally, it, it did away with the, the, you know, the old traditional value of, of saving because, I mean, certainly um, up to the boom times, people would have had to save money in order to buy a property. They would have had to make sacrifices. That whole psychology of, of, of saving was gone. When 100% mortgages were launched, they were only supposed to apply to elite borrowers. Soon, first-time buyers got them. One third were getting fully 100% mortgage loans. Uh, that, was, uh, that was clearly taking the 100% concept uh, to extremes. I suppose if I have a regret, um, my regret is that, you know, I didn't see this coming. And uh, perhaps the lessons of economics were forgotten. The Anglo growth which destabilised the banking sector also affected Irish Nationwide, a building society which has specialised in home loans with modest growth since the 1980s. It grew to one which amassed huge profits from high-risk commercial lending. Some building societies are worried about lending too much. Most people want to borrow as much as possible, but a big loan can be a heavy burden in times of small pay increases. Well, as regards my own society where money is almost readily available. As early as 2004, the financial regulator was expressing serious concern about the way the building society was run. The regulator complained of an over-reliance on the managing director and the absence of a senior executive to oversee the commercial lending function. His greatest concern was the serious weaknesses in commercial lending. The regulator cites a KPMG report, also obtained by Primetime, which said that joint ventures undertaken for many millions had no formal due diligence undertaken. It damningly says there was a lack of formal monitoring procedures and documentation on such ventures and a failure to have legal agreements fully signed before deals. It highlights the shortened lead time for loan approval as one of the potential risks of commercial loans. Most alarmingly, the KPMG report complained that the bank's internal auditors lacked the expertise to properly analyse commercial lending. Well, you're into the area of fundamental weakening of what is the strength of good lending and good practice and therefore you're you're imperiling the situation for the collectability of those loans while nationwide took some measures in response to the regulator we now see the result of nationwide's lending policies 8.3 billion of property and related loans are being transferred to the national asset management agency yet while all the maverick lending should have looked dangerous to anyone who remembered previous property crashes, experts denied there was a problem and few dissenting voices got through.
back in the autumn of 2007, I started to look at Irish bank lending. And what I saw terrified me. What I saw was that Irish banks were lending as much to builders and developers as Japanese banks had before they crashed in 1990. Morgan Kelly wrote an article in the Irish Times that property overexposure could bring down the banks. It was attacked by government representatives. They too believed in the property miracle. We're providing new houses at a much faster rate than other countries. So thankfully, Count Corlea, um, unlike uh, large parts of the rest of Europe, uh, our people are, are buying houses. What we had in Ireland was effectively groupthink, that we had this credit boom, this building boom, we were getting rich. It was heresy to, reject, to say that anything could go wrong with this. In particular, this went right up to the very top. Sitting on the sidelines or on the fence, cribbing and moaning is a lost opportunity. In fact, I don't know how people who engage in that uh, don't commit suicide, because... <laughs> the suggestion that the Irish banks could collapse seemed outrageous and irresponsible, but it turned out to be correct, unfortunately. I saw a headline recently saying, economy to collapse. You know, I can't remember which wizard wrote it or said it, but I mean, imagine up an economy collapsing and, and it's going by 6%. Coming up in part two, we see how the bank crash happened, exposing the failure of regulation and how, unlike top bankers, the rest of us now pay for the cost of the crisis. By enforcing their prescription, they would have saved the Irish banking system. Bankers haven't paid any price at all. They've, they've been rewarded. Good morning, Mr. Fitzpatrick. It's Adam Smith here from RT Primetime. September last year, the prestigious Wall Street bank Lehman Brothers crashed, sparking a world banking crisis. The flow of cheap international credit froze, and suddenly our banks were out of money to do ordinary business. Share prices plummeted and so did commercial property values. Before long, the government had to guarantee that depositors' money was secure and banks could pay what they owed, 440 billion. Wow, and unacceptable. And I would like to apologise. I, I have to say that I regret some of the lending decisions that were made. And then you paid your fat cats big, big, obscene salaries. <laughs> At this crucial moment, the watchdog of the banks, the one person above all who's supposed to know what's going on, told us. And by any estimate, the Irish banks are so well capitalised compared to any banks anywhere across Europe that I am confident that they can absorb any loans or any impairments that emerge in the ordinary course of business. Despite the fact that the banks were making monthly and even weekly disclosures to the Financial Regulator's Office, the impression given about their financial position was wholly inaccurate. Not long after, Anglo-Irish Bank had to be bailed out for three billion and was later nationalised, and AIB and Bank of Ireland were given a total of seven billion. We'd followed the Anglo-American model of light-touch regulation, advertising abroad to the International Financial Services Centre and our entire financial system as the most light-touch of all. So when regulation fell globally, we failed spectacularly. It wasn't as if we hadn't had our fair share of banking scandals before. You would say that AIB has a history of uh, getting itself into trouble from ICI back in the uh, 80s, the, the dirt scandal in the, in the 90s, um, overcharging obviously, and uh, the John Rosenack affair in the United States. A pattern seems to be emerging there where uh, things happened, but there was no particular consequence. Eugene McEarlin is a former internal auditor turned whistleblower about AIB trading in its own shares. He saw at first hand how a lack of fear of regulation influenced attitudes at AIB. When there is no expectation of enforcement, the attitude of the banks will, will, will match that, uh, that attitude. All the banks sensed, and all the bankers sensed, there were no rules. There were what they called principles-based regulation, which is a sort of pompous word for saying there were no rules they were going to enforce at all. If there was a, an inspection from, say, a UK regulator, um, you would be spending a lot of time sort of preparing for that, and it would be quite stressful. Whereas an examination from the regulator here in Ireland was, was really not something to be terribly uh, 
to be terribly bothered about. It was quite relaxed. Pat Neary presided as regulator over much of the boom and Lee stepped down earlier this year with a golden handshake of 630,000 and an annual pension of 142,000. He always struck me as a shy man, uh, not a very confident person, but he was a bright enough person. As chair of the Financial Regulators Consumer Panel, Brendan Burgess is one of many people who took up banking issues with Neary and his staff. After years of battling, he resigned shortly after the regulator's 2006 report. We said in our 2006 report that the financial regulator looks for excuses not to take action and looks for excuses not to take action and it seeks complexity where there is no complexity and we found that very frustrating that they were not showing any evidence of enforcement activity. Even when action was taken, it was often inadequate. After concerns were voiced about 100% mortgages, rather than ban or restrict them, the regulator simply told banks to marginally increase capital reserves. But the higher ratio that was imposed was just going from 4% to 4.8%. It looks very small. It was a very small change. Housing researchers staff say that 84% of these mortgages are now in negative equity. Failing to deal with consumer issues is bad, but far worse is the failure to enforce internal banking standards which safeguard the system. It wasn't a new type of banking in the way the British banks and the American banks and the Swiss banks were doing new things that nobody could understand. Everybody could understand what was going on here. The regulatory system should have had the information at its disposal to blow the whistles. It's actually strange that as, as the banks got more and more um, aggressive, let's say, in lending, as they got bigger and more and more important part of, of the economy, as credit grew, regulation became light touch. My predecessor, or the, the uh, regulatory system, did not, I think, uh, appreciate the risks. It's not that they appreciated them and decided to do nothing about them. But Primetime can reveal that the regulator did appreciate the risk posed by Irish Nationwide's own funds investments, but took a relaxed attitude in enforcing its own direction. In a 2004 letter to Nationwide, the regulator demands that it cut in half its limits of 10% and 25% for holding and development land. And it demands that it be done with immediate effect. They actually did realise that the Irish Nationwide and presumably by, by, by inference other banks' exposure to the property market was very worrying. Despite telling Nationwide to take action with immediate effect, five months later when Nationwide gave excuses for not taking action, another letter from the regulator politely asked it again to set out a timescale. That means that the financial regulator was a paper tiger, that the watchdog just didn't bark. Primetime has found other alarming evidence of regulatory failure. It concerns the controversial transaction that led Anglo to misrepresent 7.4 billion in transfer to Irish Life and Permanent and then received back again at its year end. It was moved as one thing from Anglo to Irish Life and returned to Anglo as something else. In other words, it was moved as an interbank deposit and it came back as a customer deposit. And Anglo then were able to present it as a kind of show of confidence in the bank in their accounts. So it was again giving an absolutely false impression. Anglo's listing of the billions as a corporate deposit meant that it grossly misrepresented its worth to the Irish Stock Exchange. Yet before it was reported, we've obtained a report that the regulator's head of banking told Irish Life's financial officer last October that she was ringing to confirm the transfer had taken place rather than to indicate any problems. Regulator has serious questions to answer because if the regulator followed the transaction, it must have seen the fact that this particular loan was used to actually window dress the Anglo accounts. Minutes of a meeting obtained by Primetime also show that the former central bank governor and regulator were made aware of the transfer last October when they knew Anglo was under acute liquidity pressure and should have ensured it was properly reported. That's very, very serious and I think the investigation is going to have to ask the, the hard question of the regulator, why did they do nothing about it and allow it to go ahead uh, in the Anglo accounts. An investigation into the funds transfer is now underway by the Guard of Fraud Squad and the Director of Corporate Enforcement. The financial regulator has rejected any suggestion that it would give any encouragement to this type of circular transaction.
This information adds to what the regulator knew about other Anglo dealings now being investigated. For example, the regulator also knew that Anglo offloaded 10% of its shares, which were held by Sean Quinn through stock market bets, so as to protect its share value. I mean, it is quite frightening that many of the practices that we know brought Anglo to its knees were known to the regulator. Primetime has obtained the record of the electronic funds transfer over eight years from Irish Nationwide to Anglo to cover up Sean Fitzpatrick's 122 million in secret loans. They clearly show how staggering amounts moved into Sean Fitzpatrick's accounts at Anglo's financial reporting time, something disclosed to but not picked up by the regulator. One of the biggest questions which has been left unanswered is why the central bank and the regulator, armed with so much information which endangers the system, did so little. I've talked to a lot of observers of central banking and regulation around the world and they've said, OK, the regulators didn't try to stop this, but if they had tried, would they have been allowed by the political system? Would they not have been edged out? Of course, they had the powers formally, but would they have stopped it? Everybody said that we're going to see a huge downturn uh, in 2005, linking into 2006. They were entirely wrong. Um, my view is there's not, there's not a great problem. State finances were set on a footing where it needed, as we've seen, needed stamp duty to keep, keep happening, needed property to keep happening. So why, why, then, why then kick the bank that, actually, that was actually, actually funding these activities? I mean, the, the state policy was encouraging it. People who have a, a view from, uh, from their p political or economic philosophy that regulation uh, is the answer to everything, I just don't subscribe to that. I think it's fair to say that enforcement has never been at the top of the agenda in the Irish context. What has been at the top of the agenda is the attempt to attract around 300, 315,000, but again, it's not the point. Bertie O'Hearn's former partner Celia Larkin was also given a fast-track loan of 40,000 last year without providing documentation. The loan is connected to transactions being investigated by the Planning and Payments Tribunal in its inquiry into Mr O'Hearn's personal finances and the purchasing of a house in Fibsborough. We know Celia Larkin um, never submitted any income details. I also know that roughly in March, April 2008, she has advanced a fast track loan of 40,000 euro. And again, no income verification of current accounts. No required documentation was requested. Even the former Minister of Finance, Charlie McCreevy, seemed to know who to go to to get a quick loan. Uh, Mr. McCreevy um, bought a property um, for. 1.5 million. He was sanctioned 1.6 million. Now, under our guidelines, we didn't advance 100% um, mortgages. Uh, home loans for the purchase of a family home was between 90 and 92%, and for residential investment properties, it was between 70 and 80%. But it, he got received over 100%. And did you provide the required documentation at the time? The required documentation wasn't produced. Former bankers spoke in this programme about the breach of procedures within banks, but most bank employees are too afraid because of strict confidentiality clauses in their contracts. Although some recent protection was given to whistleblowers in relation to NAMA wrongdoing, there are those who say we now need a whistleblower charter to get to the bottom of the banking crisis. We need to see a much fuller charter that applies not just to NAMA, but applies to the financial regulator, to the central bank, to many areas of, of activity where whistleblowers could be of immense value. But most of all, we need a whole new ethic within banking. What we could say with some degree of confidence is that whistleblower legislation would have led to the exposure of this wrongdoing at a much earlier stage. It would have saved the country a fortune uh, and it would have saved the country its uh, reputation in the eyes of the international community. While we are unlikely to ever know the extent of what went on in the banks during the heady days, we know who's paying for the hangover, the taxpayer. The first cost of the crisis was the state guarantee introduced last October. Taxpayers' money was used to guarantee any bank borrowings which were owed, estimated at 440 billion euro. It was essential uh, for the government to take the steps that they took. Now, it was a brave decision and, and it marked 
great leadership and great positive thinking. More recently, the government has taken the biggest gamble with taxpayers' money in our history by taking over the bank's loans to clean them off their books. Through the National Asset Management Agency, the government is paying 54 billion for 77 billion worth of loans, a discount averaging 30%. The biggest transfer of loans comes from Anglo at 28 billion, with AIB not far behind at 24 billion. And it's clear from a list of the worst commercial deals done at the height of the boom that AIB features most heavily. For example, the AIB backed Millennium Park at Osbrestown Kildare has fallen 80%, from 320 million to 64 million. And the AIB-backed former vet college on Shelburne Road in Dublin has fallen 60% from 171 million to 68 million. The land is now used as a car park. Similarly, the glass bottle site in Dublin, where Anglo was the lead lender, has fallen 80% in value. Despite NAMA taking the bad loans from the banks and swapping them for bonds so that they can generate cash to get them going again, they are still broke. NAMA is only going to be a drop in terms of what these people owe to their lenders. As a result, banks still need to borrow cash and plenty of it from the government, even though it costs dearly for the government to borrow on international markets. So far, AIB has got 3.5 billion from government and is now predicted to need a further 4.4 billion. For example, the AIB-backed Millennium Park at Osbrestown Kildare has fallen 80% from 320 million to 64 million. And the AIB-backed former vet college on Shelburne Road in Dublin has fallen 60% from 171 million to 68 million. The land is now used as a car park. Similarly, the glass bottle site in Dublin, where Anglo was the lead lender, has fallen 80% in value. Despite NAMA taking the bad loans from the banks and swapping them for bonds so that they can generate cash to get them going again, they are still broke. NAMA is only going to be a drop in terms of what these people owe to their lenders. As a result, banks still need to borrow cash and plenty of it from the government, even though it costs dearly for the government to borrow on international markets. So far, AIB has got 3.5 billion from government and is now predicted to need a further 4.4 billion. Bank of Ireland, which was also bailed out with 3.5 billion, now needs a further 2.8 billion. After Anglo's initial bailout from government for 3 billion, it's predicted to need between 5 and 6 billion, and Nationwide is said to need a further 2 billion. In the recent budget, 4,000 million in cuts were, were found, with great pain to some people. And here's the taxpayer forced into a situation that we're providing this vast amount of money for banks that will never be part of a long-term solution to the credit problem. Well, I think that we have to be clear which banks are retrievable and I think very clearly the model on which both Anglo-Irish and Irish Nationwide were built was a model that cannot be retrieved. As the taxpayer now pays dearly, it's hard to square it with the price paid by the bankers. The bankers haven't paid any price at all. They've, they've been rewarded uh, for, for what they've done. A dozen of them have been removed uh, one way or the other, but no more than that. And those people are the most culpable for what has happened. And those people have walked away with six-figure pensions. When Michael Fingleton left Nationwide last year, he took with him a 27 million euro pension. He also took a 1 million bonus for himself after the government guarantee. Similarly, Anglo former chief executive David Drum left the country with a 3.4 million package and has an annual pension of over 270,000. He is now being sued for 8 million of loans he owes to the bank. Sean Fitzpatrick got a 400,000 golden handshake with a lump sum pension entitlement of over 3.5 million tax free. He has stopped paying the 400,000 per month he owes on loans of over 100 million. Anglo's John Rowan got a 1.1 million payout before he left the bank in 2005. Your own payout when you left, um, do you think that was appropriate? Um, I believe that it was, yes, and it was all, it's all been published. I, I, have no, I have no qualms with that. I was certainly in keeping with what was happening in the industry. And you can really measure yourself by what was going on, going on in, the in the industry at the time. The remuneration structures and the regulatory structures of banking in particular uh, have led to essentially passing risks to the taxpayer because if the bank's shareholders and bank directors have their own money at stake, 
then they do take the downside as well as the upside. You have pensioners who invested all their savings in some of these banks and they've seen them blown away. They have paid the price. But many of the executives have simply walked away, some of them with golden handshakes, and they haven't seen the reduction in their standard of living. The economy has gone very, very well on the back of a pro-business government. The hope is that lessons will be learned as we all carry the massive financial burden of the banking crisis. Well, the danger of having too much regulation is that you're just going to stifle business and we're not going to have any uh, uh, success. But the message so far from bankers and advocates of light-touch regulation is that they don't easily change their spots. If anyone could tell me as to what area of regulation we could have done differently in recent years that would have prevented this particular crisis, uh, to should, they should let people not, not only me know, but other people all around the world. Some, at least, can face up to the past. So people that believed they were driving sustainable models, believed they were taking steps to actually be risk averse, were wrong. The you, industry was wrong. You believed? I, I believed what I was doing was, was, was sustainable, yes. And, I was, and, I, and then I was wrong. You regret what happened? I regret deeply. I mean, it's abs absolutely. Governor of the Central Bank saying that we somehow enticed AIB and Bank of Ireland into a course of action, which ultimately was to their ruination as well. And I don't think those things are actually true. But Anglo was a huge part of, of the problem, which we've all but run into as, a, as an economy. Um, and it's, um, it, was never, it was never meant to be like that. We tried on numerous occasions to speak to Mr. Fingleton. However, in a letter from his representative, he states that all appropriate procedures and policies were implemented by him when he was chief executive of Irish Nationwide. Good morning, Mr. Fitzpatrick. It's Andrew Smith here from RT Primetime. We spoke to you the other day. Sorry, do you mind asking a few questions? No, no, I don't want to talk. Well, I don't, no, I don't, I, I've told you before, I'm not doing any interviews. Okay, but very you. briefly, why do you think the bank failed? Would you be prepared to talk to us just about the loans? No, why you kept that's, them, that's why you, you kept you, them you, secret? No, no, you know, you know that that's not the point. No, but uh, the taxpayer that's now has to pay for those I've loans. Already, I've already to if you. you're not going to pay the interest on those loans, it means the taxpayer has to pick it up. Do you intend to repay those loans? I'm not making any comment. Okay. Why do Why do you think the bank failed and had to be nationalised? In what sense? Could you tell me that? Was it to do with the lending to top developers? Because top developers bypass credit committee and that kind of thing. Are you aware of that? You were, you were the chairman, so you would have been in a supervisory role, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Of course, yeah. Do you not Listen, think, do you not at, think the public have a right at, to know about these at, things? Can I just say to you, do you not think that I have a right to any type of privacy? Do you not think that when well, you, I spoke to you already on the phone, okay, when you asked me and I said no, and I wasn't... But the liabilities make, of the bank now have to be make, taken up by the taxpayer. I wasn't going to make an interview. I was going to do an interview with you. And that's it. But so do you regret what happened? Of course we regret it.